Obi-Wan Can Blow Me Episode 6, the one where Leia beats Darth Vader. No, seriously. Now, this episode spends most of its time painting over the massive gaping chasms which is made inside the canon, and it does it all with the power of nostalgia and one-liners that it desperately hopes are enough for the shills to defend them with. We start on Tatooine with a water ration line, which isn't surprising given the people at Disney are such a fan of bread lines. Kenobi's old boss from the meat mining comes over and pushes his way to the front of the queue. But then Reva comes up and uses the force to smash the water out of his hand to teach him a lesson. Honestly, if you wanted someone to get mad about queuing etiquette, it should have been Ewan McGregor. At least he's British. But this terrifies Kenobi's boss. And if you think it's a coincidence that the boss that dominated Kenobi has now got dominated by a strong type B, then I don't know what to tell you at this point. <laughs> and after making a big scene, she has the water carrier where Owen is, which makes complete sense. Because after making that much noise, it's not as if anyone's going to go out and warn him or anything. Welcome to a perfect example of terrible script writing, where you write yourself into a corner, and so the only way out of it is to just make everything absurd. I asked in the last episode why they didn't just annihilate the transport out of the air the moment it launched, and it turns out it's because Star Destroyers are awful and can't hit anything. Who knew Star Destroyers shot like stormtroopers? Now I can understand guns may not be that accurate if they're aiming for capital ships, but that is when they're against fighters, not big transport vessels. If as a capital ship, you can't take down a defenseless transport, honestly, I have no idea why your ship's even been made. Vader walks onto the bridge and I can't understand why he doesn't just force choke the weapons targeting guy. <laughs> Don't worry, sir. I'll hit him eventually. <laughs> But Vader has come up with a solution for the problem. Increase firepower. Yeah, I don't think that's going to help, mate. So, sir, we have a 1% hit rate. What do you think we should do? Fire more often. And if the problem is that the guns aren't accurate because they're meant to be aimed at capital ships, why aren't we launching fighters at them? I mean, at this point, you're just taking the piss. Welcome to the Star Wars parody. Now, we cut to Kenobi, who's not scared at all, because he's got plenty of experience with stormtroopers who can't aim. The, the captain comes in and says, the hyperdrive's almost ready, we're going to jump out of this place. If a Star Destroyer can't destroy a ship before it can jump out, what is even the point of it? But Kenobi's realized, I don't actually trust that guy. We're not going to make it to Tessin, are we? The guy says, no, the parts are broken. I could fix it, but would take hours, and we just don't have those hours. By the time I fix this engine, we're all going to die. And you want to remember that, because the show doesn't, or the captain, or Kenobi, or anybody else. How much time do you need? More than we have. So Kenobi looks around and realizes, I can't let Leia die. He doesn't give a crap about Luke. But Leia, oh no, that's a step too far. And Leia is playing with the merch, which isn't merch, but Disney have realized uh, they're about to make a mistake, because Leia isn't going to be in much of this episode, so how are they going to advertise the merch? They're scared. She keeps their minds off of her. Maybe I should borrow her too. Got him! But no, really, we promise it's not merch. But Luke and his father are in town and a friend comes to visit them, and his friend warns him of the danger in great detail. There's something you need to know. No, that was it. But Leia, the strong, independent type B, is doing what all strong, independent type Bs do when the crap hits the fan. Wait, you can't just leave me here! I want independence! I can do all of this on my own! Where are you going? I need help. But Kenobi explains he's the one that Darth Vader wants, so he thinks if he leaves, Darth Vader will chase him. Apparently, he's not thought that they could just drop fighters that can target the transport ship while he goes after Kenobi's little tiny vessel. For any of this story to work, we have to assume that Star Destroyers are pathetic non-entities, a lot like whoever came up with the plot. But Leia, wise and discerning as she is, came up with this intelligent rebuttal. You. I don't think you've got much choice, love. You're a ten-year-old. This script is written by the same people that let their kids scream all over the place because they have no idea how to parent. No, your ten-year-old can't scream at you and make up the rules. That's not how any of this works. Unless you're helping him look after his Tamagotchi, I really don't think you're much use, love. But he explains to the rest of the ship, I'm leaving to give you more time to fix the ship. But after saying this, the captain immediately forgets all of his prior lines. But we're so close. No, we're not. You said we didn't have enough time and you're all about to die. How come now you've suddenly got time to fix it? And why didn't you before? You are all the future. You are the future. Leia is the future of Star Wars. Not Luke. Remember, it's not Luke. It's not Luke. No, it's all about Leia. The Force is female. And that's when it went downhill. It is interesting that Kenobi found out the Force was female and then thought, well, screw that. I'm going to spend the like, rest of my life alone in a cave and never use it again. You're what needs to survive. Leia is what needs to survive. Not Luke. Not Luke. He doesn't even need protection. He's just on a planet on his own about to die. No, no, it's all about Leia. But the strangest thing is what happens next. 
because Leia just decides to say no and start running down the ship. Of course, she does it at the same waddling pace that we've seen through multiple episodes. So Kenobi chases after her to try and explain what's going on, and this guy comes out of nowhere like it's a Gillette commercial. He's like, whoa there, boy, whoa there, boy, I think she needs some space. Who are you to tell Kenobi needs space? Kenobi's literally there to protect her, that's his entire job, and you're just some thief that he met on a planet once and then turned up and did nothing, except got told to shut up? The only correct response here would be to force push him into a wall and say, who on earth do you think you are? Get out of my way. Which ironically would have been the correct response in the Gillette commercial as well. But instead, Kenobi's got a very different plan in mind. You must promise me that you get her home, Haja. Yeah, let's trust the little girl that must survive with the criminal that we barely know. That makes a lot of sense. And he even knows it. He says, you have my word. Well, the word of a liar and a thief probably doesn't mean much to you. It's good enough for me. Kenobi's just easily pleased. The other guy's like, oh, that's such an honor. I'm so glad you've trusted me. Whereas I just think it means Kenobi really doesn't give a shit. Yeah, I'll leave her with an untrustable villain that I barely know. It's fine. So Kenobi leaves to go to his escape vessel. And we cut back to Owen, Luke, and his wife. Now, obviously, Owen, being personally tasked with protecting Luke and being the man of the household, will have come up with a plan and be ready to enact it. And his plan is we need to take Luke and hide somewhere, which makes sense. It's a big planet, a big sand desert planet. It's not as if she's going to find you. On the other hand, she is a Sith Inquisitor, so what you definitely can't do is fight her. But his wife, intelligent as always, has a very, very quick response. Where? In the desert? I mean, you're on a desert planet. Where else are you going to go? Are we going to go to that mystical forest that no one's ever mentioned before? I'm not leaving my home. Then you're going to get everyone killed, love. I hope you're happy with yourself. But she refuses to leave because in our house we have a chance. Doesn't make any sense. It's an Inquisitor. And the guy goes, if we stay, we need help. I'm not putting anyone else in danger. We're enough. You and me. No, you're not. So at that point, she opens up a hole in the wall and pulls out two rifles from it, throws one to him, and he seems to be surprised by the fact that they exist. And so his wife takes charge and tells him to take positions, and I'm like, what is going on? And this is what Disney does all the time. You've got a man who was tasked with something, and he came up with a plan, and it was a good plan, and it was would have worked, and everything was fine. But no, you can't have him do that, because he's just a man after all. So the woman has to take over, take charge, come up with a different plan, a stupid plan, that would get everyone killed, but somehow it'll magically work out. So back on the ship, Kenobi's talking to Leia, and he tells her, oh, please tell your father that I wanted to send you home, and I tried to take you there. And he gives her a gift of a weapon holster. It's empty. Perceptive as always. Well, I wasn't going to give you a blaster, Leia. I wouldn't even trust her near the edge of tall buildings. You're ten years old, but you won't always be. If that's meant to be deep, it's not. <laughs> One day you'll grow up. One day you'll realize that time passes. <laughs> So then the two of them hug. I can only assume this is her passing on her incredible force powers to him, because he'll definitely need them later on. So Kenobi's there just sitting on a box, staring at his lightsaber, uh, presumably trying to work out how it to turn it on, because he's barely used it for most of the series. And it's worth reminding you that all of this time, that all of this has been going on, there is a Star Destroyer right behind them, shooting them constantly at record speed, and for some reason, can't hit them and they never die. It, it's ridiculous. They are an unarmed transport vessel. Their shields wouldn't be able to stand up to that attack. I don't know why any of this is happening. But Kenobi starts talking to Qui-Gon, his master, and saying that I must face Vader. This must end today, whether he dies or I do. And like Yoda gave you instructions on how to communicate with him ages ago, and you just haven't bothered to do it. And so now you're essentially just speaking into the air. This entire scene would have meant a lot more if you hadn't destroyed Kenobi for absolutely no reason and made him a complete fool. Because because right now, the only reason he can't talk to Qui-Gon is his own laziness. But then the captains come back, and he's so busy trying to remember his current lines, he's forgot every single one that he said before this time. You don't have to do this, you know. Yes, he does. If he doesn't leave, the destroyer will keep shooting at you, and eventually, at some point, it'll hit you, and then you'll die. But that's not me saying it. That's what the captain said himself earlier in the episode about five minutes ago. We can still fix the drive. No, you can't. You don't have time to fix the drive before they blow you up. These were your own words. How have you forgotten them? It's not about us, is it? Yes, it is. He didn't want to leave until you said, if you don't leave, we're all going to die. You want to do it. It's about you and him. No, it isn't, because otherwise he would have left right at the start. He only came up with the plan when you said, we're all going to die because we don't have any time. And then he leaves. I don't even know what that scene was. Broken. There are not many leaders left. People follow you. Don't stop. Just get started. He's getting a spin-off series. <laughs> What's he going to do? Fly around the universe getting shot at in his indestructible defenseless ship. So all of this time, the destroyer has been constantly shooting at them. And I have no idea why Vader doesn't just use the force to stop them like he did before. But obviously they can't hit them because they're doing this. 
seriously, you're just taking the piss at this point. You will never convince me that this is not a deliberate parody. But Kenobi leaves in his little vessel, and now they have to make a choice. My lord, we must continue our pursuit of the insurgents. I don't know why we need to make a pursuit of the insurgents. We can actually take both of them out. We can drop fighters and they can go after the transport vessel. And we can chase down Obi-Wan Kenobi. Seriously, this isn't a choice you have to make. Why has everybody forgot that Star Destroyers carry TIE fighters and they can shoot things down? In fact, are specifically designed to shoot down the highly mobile things that the capital ships apparently can't hit. Now is our chance to take down the network in its entirety. Seriously, I don't know how he does it. Talking like that gives me a headache. But he says we cannot prioritize one lone Jedi. He is not just any Jedi. And as he watches him go through the window, because the most advanced technology we have on the ship is windows, Vader decides to follow Kenobi, and for some reason, just let the transporter go away. We're not going to attach a probe to it, drop fighters so they can chase it, or anything. No, it's just gone. There must have been someone that liked Star Wars that was also in the military that you could have hired to consult for this role. There, there must be. So the destroyer starts chasing his tiny little vessel, still firing at it, and still completely unable to hit everything. At this point, you wonder why they've even bothered to have cannons on the ship at all. Meanwhile, back on Luke's planet, Reva has tracked Luke down. So you realize Kenobi is never going to make it on time. That means the leaks are probably true. The parents tell Luke to stay inside the room, not do anything, and run if she gets past the parents. Meanwhile, the parents are going to go and set up an ambush. The weird part is he tells Luke that it's the Tuscans doing it, not some weird woman with a lightsaber. And it is a problem because lying to him about that will mean he's not prepared for what's coming. And when it comes, it will definitely stick in his mind because you've lied to him about it. So when the original trilogy comes around, he'd be like, oh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yeah, I remember when I was chased by someone who used the force powers before and the other lightsaber. Oh, I've seen one of these. Do you remember that from the original films? Because uh, I don't. I'm not afraid. You should be though. Not not being afraid of something that's dangerous doesn't make you brave, it makes you stupid. Bravery is being afraid and carrying on doing it anyway. Not being afraid means that you are unaware of the actual real danger facing you, and that will mean that you will inevitably mess up. So the destroyer is still firing at Kenobi, and uh, it's going about as well as you'd expect at this point. I don't know if you saw where that last one went. I'm, I'm not being funny, but the ship's over here, and that fired off up there somewhere. <laughs> So Kenobi picks the Minerius planet and lands on it. Prepare my ship. Vader decides he's going to go down to 1v1 him because it'd be really interesting for the TV series if that happened again. I will face him alone. Not if he's got Leia on his side, you won't. And apart from the fact that they can't hit the broad side of a barn, there's still no reason they can't just shoot him from orbit, which is what I would have done. But Kenobi lands because apparently he knows that he's not going to get blasted by the destroyer. And Darth Vader leaves in his little vessel. I wonder if when he was walking to that past all the TIE fighters, he was like, oh, duh, why didn't we just launch all of those when we were fighting the transport vessel? That would have been smart. I can't believe I just forgot all these ships. But as Kenobi takes off his robes, he finds... Merch! Hang on, it's not merch, it's not merch. We just, it's just that it needed to be in the show. I mean, it serves absolutely no purpose, but we needed to be in the show because it's merch. It's not merch, we promise. Oh, he's so happy with his new gift. You know who else would be happy with a gift like that? Your child, yeah, you should probably buy your child that gift as merch. It's not merch! Oh, I'm gonna put it on the side as if it's an ornament or a toy figure. This entire scene serves absolutely no purpose except to advertise the merch. We even get a close-up zoom of it at the end, and they put it just before the Vader scene because they knew that's when everyone would be paying attention. Oh, Disney. But back to Luke and a zombie is about to attack them. Oh, sorry, it's just Reva. It's not that she's dead, it's just that she should be. So they get a perimeter warning that Rey is now attacking them, bearing in mind they were supposed to take their positions ages ago. So it gives the impression that they've been going around setting up traps or something for it in the meantime, and that's why they couldn't just take up positions and hide. No, no, they've not been doing that. That would be too smart. So Vader lands, and Kenobi and Vader's fight isn't going to be on any sort of cool volcanic planet or anything. No, it's going to be on a very, very, very dark moon, so you can't really see much of what's going on. So, director, what kind of color palette were you after when you were designing the Obi-Wan Kenobi series? Well, I'd actually just like a lot of gray and black. If you just give me a lot of gray and black, I really think that spices up the atmosphere of a story. When Star Wars fans imagine Star Wars, they should only have one word in their mind. Drab. Now, I really wanted to like this scene. I really did. It's really up my street. Lightsaber fights are why I like Star Wars. Lightsabers and blaster fights. That's what I'm here for. I am but a simple normie of simple pleasures, and I don't pretend to be anything else. Unfortunately, even though I was kind of drawn into the fight at first, I also know how it ends. And I don't care about nostalgia or callbacks to movies. So, uh, yeah, all your little emotional manipulative tricks don't really work on me. It's gonna be an oops.
But the strangest part is Vader chases Obi-Wan down to this planet, lands, comes out of his ship, walks towards Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan's just standing there, and then when Obi-Wan finally approaches him, he says this. Have you come to destroy me, Obi-Wan? You came to him! This is like if a stalker breaks into your house, you come home and he's like, are you gonna leave me alone at some point? This whole thing's getting rather tiresome. I will do what I must. That explains why he took this role then. Electricity bill due, was it? Oh look, he's pulling a pose that he's pulled before! Oh, isn't this amazing, Star Wars? Seriously, you go on Twitter and look at what people are saying about this show when everything is just picture from Obi-Wan Kenobi, picture from a movie. This is why it's good. Let's not say that something is good because it references something that somebody else made and they had nothing to do with. In an Obi-Wan Can Blow Me show, it's not a positive that he does something which is recognizably himself. That should be all of the time. He should be always acting like himself. In fact, that's why the show is awful, because for the rest of the series, he hasn't been. <laughs> I'd kind of like to think that a Jedi should be able to hold his lightsaber without moving like a surgeon. Vader can, otherwise Reva would have been dead multiple times by now. <laughs> but then they fight, and what we get is odd. You can understand Vader putting a lot of aggression and violence and strength into all of his force, but both of them fight as if neither of them know how to fight. And I don't know much about sword fighting at all, but these two fight how I would fight with the lightsaber, as if I had no idea what I was doing. All of the moves are like really clumsily put together. Just kind of awkward, massive swings. Like, just look at this. Uh, I don't know if that hit you. The whole point of lightsaber fights is they're meant to be fluid. You're fighting with swords that weigh basically nothing. You can use the force to be faster and more acrobatic. It, everything's most a flow, and this doesn't. And I don't know what's going on. Maybe you and McGregor is a big fan of Elden Ring, but he just keeps doing forward rolls all of the time throughout the entire thing. Like that. And I think the problem is when you compare these to the movies, or even just lightsaber fights that people will do on YouTube, it is nowhere near as impressive or well done. And so even though I want to light the lightsaber fight, I have to come back and go, eh, it, it, it's okay. It's the kind of fight you'd get if you and a mate just went into a back garden and started swinging lightsabers at each other. And of course they do my most personally hated move out of everything, which also happened in the last episode against Reaver, although this is not as bad as that one. For some reason, we're just going to duck under each other and then go back to back. He could literally have turned around at any point and just stabbed Vader in the back, but for some reason, I'm going to make sure my back is to him and then keep doing this. At least that only lasted a short amount of time. Unlike the Reaver one, which seemed like it happened for an eternity. And it goes on for a while and it's alright, but Battle of the Ages, it most certainly isn't. But back to Luke and Reaver enters their home. This is a woman who can sense people with the Force, except has no idea where these people are, apparently. She wanders around a bit as both parents are pointing their guns at her from two different angles. And then when her back's to him, the father takes the shot. Of course he misses. Pesky men, always messing things up, eh? If only he'd waited for his wife, everything would have been fine. If you have one shot at a Sith Inquisitor, make sure you hit it, you moron. Because then she immediately turns around, starts deflecting all of his blaster bolts. This would be the perfect time for the wife in the different position to shoot her in the back. Instead, she starts shooting. Apparently never hits her because she never gets shot in the back at all. Okay, I've only just realized how mentally deficient these two people were because I never noticed the first time through. I thought the wife was down here in the bottom corner somewhere on the opposite side of the wall. And so they'd set up a crossfire, as would make sense from a strategic point of view. Instead, she's up here behind some boxes and he's over here. So they've got one firing angle at the both of them, and it's a Jedi who can deflect blaster bolts from both sides. Not a single one of you thought maybe we should take a different angle so she can't deflect both people at the same time, eh? No, no. And I know why they did it. They did it because, quite frankly, there probably isn't a set over here, and so they couldn't have a camera from both sides. But at the same time, it still makes both of these characters incredibly stupid. So now we've got two people shooting an Inquisitor, but I guess it's nice she's being generous and she's not deflecting any of their blaster bolts back at them. No. So instead, both of them survive. I don't know how both of them survive a run-in with an Inquisitor, but here we are. The father knows all weaknesses of both Sith and Jedi, and that's why he knows that Reaver is weak to plant pots. So he kicks one of those down in her nearby vicinity. Will never be of any danger to her at all, only even goes halfway to her. But obviously, Reva is highly allergic to the pollen that will be spread everywhere the moment that hits the ground. Oh no, it's biological warfare! <laughs> so then he throws this chest down, which bounces as if it's entirely empty. And we're back to the extremely average lightsaber duel. Turns out, if you watch this at double speed, it actually looks a lot better than it does if you watch it at its normal one. Speed and fluidity 
Highly important to lightsaber battles. This one's really slow and clunky. We still got the classic Star Wars problem as well. Why did you spin? <laughs> really nice of Ada just to stand there and wait for him to complete a spin rather than just pointing down his lightsaber and killing him. Alden Ring roll number two. Alden Ring roll number three. And when I say Elden Ring, I mean Elden Ring. Those two were back to back. He did them immediately. But finally, something breaks up the monotony when Kenobi gets a good hit on Vader, staggers him and breaks his block, and then he starts pushing the rock onto him. Of course, it turns out that Vader's just way more powerful than him. Not that you'd know that from what he says next. Your strength has returned. I don't think you can say that when he still looks constipated while he's doing it. The weird thing is Vader just yeets that off into the distance rather than firing it at Kenobi's face. Oh, it's really clever actually. They're just setting it up so that when it happens in reverse, you can see their equivalent power levels. And when I say I can't take the fight seriously, it is because of things like this. What were you waiting for? <laughs> Swipe. Oh no, I hope I don't have to wait here for the next five seconds and wait for Vader to actually hit me so I can react for it. Oh, he's going to hit me any time now. I'm just counting in my head for the- oh, there it is! J Obi-Wan Kenobi, Jedi Master, breaks his own block and leaves it open, because in turn-based combat, it's now his turn to get damaged. Vader breaks it by shoving over a rock and just taking out Obi-Wan Kenobi's legs. The thing is, I'm not exactly sure the showrunners understand how soil works, basically anything else. I kind of think that they've been reading too much about the Hollow Earth, and don't realize that underneath the Earth's crust is just more stuff, because Vader shoves his hand down onto the ground, Cracks it all open. Planet is just all hollow underneath, and so Kenobi falls down into it. No, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now I have the high ground. It's little references like that that you have to cream yourself over in order to think that this show is, uh, good. Bearing in mind, nothing stops Obi-Wan just jumping backwards out of the hole away from Vader. It's a big, massive hole. A lot like inside the writer's heads, it's just a huge, vacuous space. But then Vader, rather than using his lightsaber to make sure Kenobi is actually dead, just starts piling rocks on top of him. If you don't see a body, they're not dead. But Vader, for some reason, seems incapable of killing anybody at all. Everybody tries to kill just come back. You'd think he'd learn his lesson by this point. So he's there just smashing rock after rock after rock on it until he fills the entire thing. Did you truly think that you could defeat me? Do you truly think he's defeated? Because if you do, you're the one that looks like an idiot. Seriously, how long would it take you to check? You have failed. Master. I think we only put that line in to humiliate Vader. It used to be if you want a job done properly, do it yourself. Now it seems to be if Vader wants to get anything done, he's gonna have to get a type B to do it for him. Otherwise, he's gonna do a job, mess up the ending, and achieve absolutely nothing. Now, on the edge of this walkway are huge gaps. If she just force pushes him off, then she wins the fight. For some reason, we're not gonna do that. Instead, she lets him swing at her with a big pole. Don't know why she doesn't just slash it and cut it in half. He stabs at her, she still doesn't just slash to the right and cut it in half. Swipes across again, still doesn't cut it in half. I really have no idea what she's doing. I'm gonna be a gymnast instead of a Sith. Only when he actually smacks her on the side, still don't know how he got that smack in unless she let it deliberately happen to her. Does she then think, okay, I should probably do something about this. Also worth noting now, Owen has actually done more damage to Reva than Obi-Wan Kenobi has in the entire series. Well, finally, she stops the bar and cuts it in half. But we get more confirmation of how terrible a character Reva is with this next line. What do you want? Justice. Nothing about this is justice and can't be seen as justice. Oh, well, you see, Vader killed her friends, and so she's going to kill his son because that's justice. To who? What? Where? What you should have said is vengeance, and that actually would have been a very Sith thing to say. Justice? Not really high up on the uh, Sith leaderboards there, is it? So then the father hits it where I'm assuming the lightsaber wound is supposed to be. I don't know how he knew that was there. Maybe he'd watched the previous episode this week, I don't know. And of course she screams in agony. I mean, at this point, he must be surprised that it hurt that much, surely, because he shouldn't know there's a wound there. And then she just backhands him around the face like a boss. And eventually... Force pushes him off the walkway, which is something she could have done immediately as he had no defense against it because he's not a force user. This is an Inquisitor struggling against a man with no force powers purely because the script demanded that she talk to him first. But then obviously, because he's a man and to Disney, that means he's not very smart, he shouts out this. Bro, she's coming! So now Reva knows that his wife's in there waiting for her and setting a trap. That was really smart of him. So then, despite the fact that she knows this is a trap, she still gets surprised by the woman that she's literally heard the guy call out to. <laughs>
and gets smacked around the face. And then little Luke yeets himself out of a roof and runs into the distance across the sand planet. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but if I was Luke's age and I got chased across the desert by a woman holding a lightsaber, I think I'd remember that. I think, I think that would be deeply ingrained in my mind. That would even be something that I would bring up when I later was told about the Force and a guy pulls out a lightsaber in front of me. Oh yeah, I've seen one of those before. I was chased through the desert by someone wielding one of them. And Reva just leaves the mother there, doesn't even swipe her on the way past or anything. I don't know why. I guess you can't have an Inquisitor acting like an evil Inquisitor when you're supposed to make them good in about five minutes, eh? Yeah, that would be a good look. Despite the fact that it goes directly against the character at the present moment. So Luke is petrified, running across the desert. Yeah, still won't remember it in a few years. It'll be fine. Cut back to Obi-Wan Kenobi, who's put on a few pounds. And he's inside the rubble using the Force to essentially hold everything back which you would have thought that Vader would be able to feel. Hold on, I've just crushed a man under there under loads of rock, but I can feel a massive amount of force usage going on under there. It's almost as if he must be alive to use the force. Now you see, Vader is really stupid in this series, and Obi-Wan can blow me is in full constipation mode. Ah, it's so challenging and tough. Oh no, I can't believe I can do it. All of the rocks are coming down on him and he's hearing Vader's voice in his head. But then through the darkness, through the cacophony of voices, he hears one. Shining light, one shining beacon of humanity above the rest. And it's Leia. Oh, look, he's thinking of Leia. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, look, there's a picture of Luke next. Blink and you'll miss it. No, I mean that seriously. From bright light into image of Luke, it's this. Gone. <laughs> I hope you saw Luke because you're not going to see him again. But there's another picture of Leia. That's two to one. Another picture of Leia, three to one. Leia, four to one. Oh, four to two. Do you want to see how long this one lasts? From the drop scene. And he's gone. <laughs> five to two. In the two little bursts of the power-up scene for Kenobi, we have five pictures of Leia, two pictures of Luke. And that is what gives him his strength. And no, they're not balanced at all. Let's just have a look at one of those scenes, just so you can see exactly what it's like live. Those were all the images. And if we pause on Leia, you can see, oh, it's Leia, Leia, it's the future Leia is exactly why Obi-Wan is here. Labor Leia is what gives Obi-Wan his powers. Leia is the only reason that Obi-Wan exists into the future to protect Luke. Leia is everything. Leia underpins the entire Star Wars saga. Why? Because the Force is a type B. And that is why Obi-Wan Kenobi, through the power of Leia, can escape his rock problem. Oh, and boy, and how does he escape his rock problem? He doesn't just lift the rocks. They explode out in a shower of power. You know, the kind of power that you can only have as a strong, independent type B. All you see is rock and dust, I tell you. The power of Leia is awesome. Oh, can you just imagine if Obi-Wan Kenobi was this strong? <laughs> He could even easily climb out of there. If only he could have done that up the other wall when Vader was there, hey? So Vader is walking away at the slowest speed possible because if he goes too fast, he'll walk past the CGI background. And as he's going, he suddenly senses a presence. Must be Leia behind me. <laughs> so the power of Leia attacks him with a lightsaber. And this one is actually a lot better than the first one. It kind of implies that they were deliberately crap in the first fight, which doesn't make any sense. But at least this one does go a lot more fluid. That said, we still do get the most stupid lightsaber move known to man. Yeah, that's right. He passed the lightsaber around his back into his other hand for absolutely no reason whatsoever. <laughs> uh, you can argue that sometimes you might be able to get to spin in without someone just attacking you in the back. There is never a time that passing your lightsaber behind you is going to be a benefit. <laughs> At least with a swing, you could get more force in. You're going to get even less force with something that you've just passed behind your back. We still have to put up with Darth Vader stopping lightsabers with the force, though. Which is still as ridiculous as it always was. You've now made lightsabers redundant. Why don't we just fight with the force from this point on? But then Kenobi force pushes Vader back. And you're like, well, how did he have the power to do that to Vader? Well, it's because it's not just Obi-Wan Kenobi's power, is it? No, this is the power of Leia. And that is his summoning ritual for Leia. And this is when he shows his true Leia powers. Come to me, O oh power of mighty Leia. Summon the rocks of defeat. No, I have to admit, this scene is, though, pretty cool. <laughs> As he lifts all the rock up in worship of Leia and then fires them all at Vader. The thing is, you'd expect Vader to break them by holding the force out in some way, but they seem just to be smashing on his shoulder. Now, from the top view, you can see that there's kind of an orb around Vader and the rocks seem to be shattering in front of him as if he's guarding himself with the force. Thing is, because this is Disney and the quality of the production so far, I don't know whether that's deliberate 
or whether someone just messed up the CGI and had them break in front of him rather than on him because they didn't know where he was. Because then it cuts to this scene and you can definitely see Rox connecting with him. And it looks like he's then just breaking them with his elbow. So maybe the CGI before was trash. I don't know. I don't know. Anything goes in this show. But Vader pushes through and re-attacks Kenobi. Meanwhile, Reva is chasing Luke through the desert, even though he won't remember this in a few years. Luke is hiding on one of the rocks, and you'd expect Reva to be able to sense him immediately, but she can't, because that power only actually works when the plot requires it to. Ironically, if he just stayed still and didn't move, she'd never find him. But finally, Kenobi gets one over on Vader and then just starts smashing all of the buttons on his suit, causing it to malfunction so he can't breathe. I hope you're getting all those flashbacks to other bits of the IP. And at this point, he's won. He's just taking him apart piece by piece, slashes him across the back, force pushes him once again, which you can understand this time because now he's entirely defeated. And then we get this move, which absolutely would have killed Vader. The lightsaber clearly goes into his face a long way. But, as if by magic, or the almighty benevolence of Leia, he just so happens to have cut half of his helmet off. How he did that without attacking his face, no one will ever know. I don't actually even think the angle is there for where the lightsaber went in to not have immediately cut him in the face. But ours is not to question how the almighty Leia has given us this gift. Leia works in mysterious ways. Now, I hope you weren't expecting anything more than just trying to rely on pulling back an old actor to get some sympathy from the audience. Like, I hope you weren't expecting a good plot or a good script or anything, because we're going to spend a lot of time now just desperately plastering over all the plot holes we've made during the entire series. As it goes, Anakin! Anakin is gone, I am what remains. I'm sorry, Anakin. Are you not listening? He just said Anakin's gone. But if you wanted a line which is meant to appear deep and actually isn't deep at all, well, have the scriptwriters got a bumper sticker for you? I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. Oh. No, you see, if you think about it, he's actually really deep and is explaining to Obi-Wan Kenobi that it's not his fault, and so he can go forth light of the burden that he's had for the rest of the series. It's incredibly emotionally complex. It's a bumper sticker. And writers will say things like this all the time, which don't actually mean anything. And then you get a load of people going, oh, that's so deep and complicated. And all it is, is just a load of people being incredibly pretentious. Love is the most powerful thing on earth. And my friend is truly dead. You see, that explained in the later movies why he said to Luke that his father was dead. Quick! Plot holes, paint over them in nostalgia and give them one line so that all the shills can try and defend the show. Oh, actually, no, it's just because you don't understand. If you see paragraph 13, quote A, it clearly states this is why his friend is dead and that makes everything okay because he said one line. And folks, welcome to the rest of the episode. And with that, rather than putting an end to Vader, who will go forth from this very moment and kill a load of people, he just walks off and leaves him alive. So from this point on, Every single person that Vader kills, their blood is on Obi-Wan Kenobi's hands. So many people are going to say that that scene is amazing because of those two lines. When actually, you just entirely destroyed the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi by making him complicit in the Empire's future slaughter. Congratulations. What a great moral move and moral compass you must have. So rather than staying still and therefore being completely undetected by the Sith Inquisitor who can also detect people, he decides to run along all of the rocks. Of course, inevitably, he knocked one of the rocks and made a noise because for some reason, she's walking along and he's decided to run directly next to her all the way along. All he had to do is stop and this could have all been avoided. Instead, she force knocks him off the rocks and smashes him onto the ground, which Obi-Wan can blow me feels, but can't do anything about because he completely abandoned Luke and his only mission in life for this entire series. Because praise almighty Leia! It's not as if you cared about him at any other point in this entire series, I'm not sure why you do now. But with that, he jumps to hyperspace, and in the bottom left, don't worry, it's not merch. And Reva finally sees her target, the thing that she has been after her entire life. This entire series, everything she has ever wanted is in front of her. To get revenge on Darth Vader, by taking from him something that he cares about, just like he did from her. Of course, Obi-Wan Kenobi's not here to stop her. Not that they could anyway, because you know, you can't have a man fight a woman, let alone a man stop a type B. And that leaves only one choice. That she gets a lightsaber out, and then, just as she's about to strike down Luke, sees his body vulnerable on the floor. She sees herself. 
because the oh, because all of Disney know there's only one thing that a type B actually cares about. Herself. We get some flashbacks back to the temple. And once again, as she's ready to make the slash, she can't because she realizes she is just like Vader and she would be striking down herself. So even though she triples down and tries desperately to do it, she just can't. So Obi-Wan Kenobi was saved because he channeled the power of Almighty Leia. And Reva defeated herself. Praise be Kathleen Kennedy, the bringer of trash stories and the destruction of every character. This entire series, we've had type Bs that just take charge over all of the men everywhere and yet simultaneously come up with the most ridiculous plans in the world that somehow mysteriously just work even though they shouldn't and then they defeat themselves because Disney thinks this is what makes them look strong and it just makes it look like a dung beetle. Everybody knows that she's pushing a pile of crap in front of her but that's what she's been given to deal with and that's what she's got to do because she signed a contract and so she doesn't have much choice. But instead, you humiliate Reva. It's no surprise that you came out and attacked people at first because of how you've treated Reva. You've treated Reva like filth. When it does make her look strong when you make her defeat herself or powerful or anything else. It makes her look weak and pathetic. She's not good. She saved one person. She's been slaughtering Jedi her entire life and not cared about it at all. And now he's like, oh no, I'm a good person now. Oh, because I didn't just kill me. Ah. Oh. What you've created is a farce. And, and both of the parents are like, Luke, Luke, where have you run off to? Luke, Luke. Just staring out across the open desert where they can see for miles. And Kenobi runs up to him. Where is he? Where is he? We don't know. We can't see him. So Kenobi just runs off. And then three seconds later, there was like, oh, he's over here. And it cuts to him. And there she is. And I'm like, hang on. Could you not see you with binoculars? I don't know. About a hundred miles away. <laughs> Those are the same rocks that they fought in and she's just walked all of that way across flat ground. Couldn't you see it? No, not even with binoculars. No. Oh, I could only see her when she stood in front of the CGI background that we've got hung up on a wall. So she brings Luke back and obviously everyone else at this point should think he's dead because she puts him on the ground and he's not moving. And I don't know about anyone else, but if I was there, I'd expect all three of them to shoot her. <laughs> Like, literally, you tried to kill the parents, chase the son to kill him, and now you brought back what looks like a corpse. Why is everyone just standing there staring at you? But until that point, everyone is just standing there staring at her and doing nothing about it. It really doesn't fit. Except for the guidelines, obviously, that they read that a man can't defeat a woman, so she has to defeat herself. I couldn't do it. That's because you're crap at everything you've done in the entire series. I failed them. We killed them all and I couldn't do it. Don't really know who him is. Do you mean Luke? Because he's alive, so you can't have hailed him. Do you mean Vader? Because I thought failing Vader was the entire point of this. You mean Vader? Go after Vader! His son's got nothing to do with any of this. You haven't failed them. Well, she's failed at pretty much everything she's ever done in the entire series, so she must have failed somebody, dude. By showing mercy, <laughs> you have given them peace. That's not how that works. Vader's death would have given them peace, which coincidentally you had the chance to give and just walked off and let him alive so he can do it to more people, so... uh Obi-Wan Kenobi's evil now, congratulations! Have I become him? Yes, absolutely. You slaughtered loads of Jedi and worked for him for years and years and years. You have absolutely become Vader, except a far, 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 far inferior version of him. No, you've chosen not to. What do you mean? Of course she has! She did everything Vader did! She was hunting down Jedi for him! I don't think we have to lie and sugarcoat reality for the evil murderous scum in front of us. She chose not to for one person. She slaughtered hundreds of people at least. In her own words, we've done far worse than that when she cut off somebody's hand for no reason. Who you become now, that is up to you. Yes, and we'll find out what you become in your spin-off series. I mean, this one was basically your own series. Any oh, that's not a good pause, is it? <laughs> I was gonna say this one was basically your series anyway. So then she pulls out a lightsaber, which is gonna be pretty important to her because from this point on, she's gonna get hunted by the Empire and the Inquisitors. So she'll need to defend herself. And she throws it on the ground. Now you're free. No, now she's dead. She doesn't have a lightsaber to defend herself with. Now she's basically Obi-Wan Kenobi. The first time anyone comes to attack her, she'll just get absolutely annihilated by them because she doesn't have a lightsaber with her to defend herself. We both are. No, you're not. Vader will be coming for you. You've just humiliated him, attacked him, and he's been hunting you for years. Vader will definitely be coming to hunt you now again, even stronger than before, because you've defeated him. You've humiliated him. At least that should be the plot, if it wasn't for a future scene, which Obi-Wan Kenobi has no idea about, but he must do because he said this, and so he must have read the script. Oh, look, this is that scene that Obi-Wan Kenobi knew about from across the galaxy before it happened, because <laughs> Vader is reacting how you would expect Vader to react. 
which is what Kenobi should have known he would wreck like. He's like, oh, we're sending out all the probes. We're going to hunt down every planet. We will definitely get him this time. But of course, the Disney writers realize, oh no, we've just made a massive plot hole. We've got to paint over with nostalgia and one single line again. Somebody call the shills and give them one line that they can try and use to defend this crap. <laughs> you seem agitated, my friend. I mean, he is a Sith. I don't know if you've realized, but they tend to be pretty emotional. So he tells Vader, I wonder if your thoughts are clear on this. And then he says, perhaps your feelings for your old master may have left you weakened, even though he's a Sith, and therefore his emotion and his rage will objectively make him stronger than before. This is literally one Sith telling another Sith, hey, up, calm down, you should probably act like a Jedi because those emotions of yours might be getting in the way. So then we just get this weird exchange. Wonder if your thoughts are clear on this. Perhaps your feelings for your old master have left you weakened. If your past cannot be overcome. Kenobi means nothing. And that's it? Oh yeah, you know that Obi-Wan Kenobi guy, the guy I've been hunting for years, who literally left me in this state that I'm full of rage and anger for, which is one of the reasons I'm so strong in the Force, because it gives me that power. Uh, yeah, my master said that emotions are a bad thing, and so now I should just be stoic, like a Jedi, because that'll make me a good Sith, and now I'm not after him at all. Do you think that's filled in that big gaping chasm? Nah, but you know... The shills will probably point to that line as if it's actually explained anything when it hasn't. And then we finally get the Imperial March after six episodes of not having it. What? Implying that he wasn't really Vader before, but now he's actually given up the chase for Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now he's Vader. Literally none of that makes sense, all right? Not none of it. The writers expect you to go to a house, see cracks going all up the outside, and they're just like, nah, ignore that, it's fine, it's fine. Bit of plaster. Bit of plaster's all you need for that, mate. Just put a poster on that just reads, nostalgia, you'll be fine. Back to the planet where the almighty Leia should have been the entire series. Is this where someone's going to point out that, oh, well, this looks just like one of her dresses that she wears when she's an adult, like they've been doing for the entire series, because quite frankly, I don't care. <laughs> and her mum's like, oh, is that a holster? I love it. As you can see, the holster implies that Leia was always ready to lead the rebellion. So Leia and the parents go out to the docking pad. You see, this is actually a very cunning trick where we go full circle from the finale right back to the start of the first series. One thing the showrunners seem to have forgotten is that kind of tactic only works if you had good emotions and feelings about the start of the loop, which is coincidentally why this show is desperately desperately trying to cover itself with as much nostalgia and references to the original trilogy as possible. But Leia has a discussion about leadership with her father, and um, she offers him a bit more unsolicited advice. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to want to change a few things. You're 10, you can't change anything, love. Shut up. That's the only thing that should be the response right there. No, you're not going to change your bedtime. No, you're not going to eat marshmallow fluff every single lunch, breakfast, and tea all throughout your entire life. No, it's not gonna happen. No, you're not putting pineapple on pizza either. That's disgusting filth that they do on other planets. Then we'll change things together. How about no? I'm the leader of an entire planet. You still hide behind the sofa when a Dalek appears on the TV. We are not the same. And of course, never want to leave a gaping plot hole alone. The writer thinks, hey, we'll just make it worse. And so Obi-Wan visits her again, of course, with his merch in tow. Don't worry, it's not merch. We can never repay you. Well, you're the leader of the planet, you must have some kind of money. That poor guy was mining his lunch out of a dead carcass in a desert, and you live on this planet and rule it. You could offer him something, dear. She has already done that. Yes, she has offered me her force powers. Although a bit of money would be nice so that I don't have to work mining fish for the rest of my life. And don't worry, we do zoom in on the merch. I fear for her future. That's understandable, she does appear in the Disney sequels. Her future isn't the best, but at least she gets a few good movies in first. Well, if you ever need my help again, you know where to find me. Oh, Lucky said a line that references the originals, just that covers all the plot holes, don't? Don't look over there, he covered it, he covered it, he did one line, that's enough. You see that big chasm over there? I've put a bit of toothpaste over it, it's fine. But the father's like, let's hope that day never comes. And then Obi-Wan Kenobi talks to Leia in probably one of the most cringe-worthy scenes of our time. And I hate the word cringe. So when I use it, you know I really mean it. What do you do now? He's probably gonna go back to being emo in a cave. But he says, I don't know. What do you think I should do? Because obviously, if I need life advice, I go to a random 10-year-old and ask them. Seriously, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I was 10, I probably would have said the sun or something. I'm not going to have had better advice for somebody else. But instead, she just says, I think you should sleep. Yes. I don't think you need to tell people who watch this episode that. They've had enough struggles staying awake for it as it is. But he starts to tell her about her parents. Now, actually, he did know them all along. But it was at this point, I had wondered if I'd... Uh, 
drank a little bit too much. Princess Leia Organa, you are wise, discerning, kind-hearted. Oh, we've been watching the same TV series, Wise and Discerning. She jumped off a roof for no reason whatsoever to her death. When I heard that, I had to check for a gas leak. I wasn't sure if I was about to die. The only thing I could have seen that would have explained that was just rampant hallucinations. But at least it goes, these were qualities that came from your mother. I'm like, okay, what are you going to say about a father? That should be good. But you're also passionate and fearless, forthright. And these are gifts from your father. I mean, they were odd choices, weren't they? You also turned against all of your friends, went into a temple and started wiping out indiscriminately all of the occupants, just like your father. <laughs> Seriously, maybe we'll just shut up about that one. Both were exceptional people. I mean, firstly, I don't think she was. And secondly, Vader was exceptional for all of the wrong reasons. <laughs> who bore an exceptional daughter. Who has exceptional powers, who saved me from an exceptional death. Yes, we get it, bruv. But then he's like, I wish I could tell you more. And she looks over at her parents who are just standing there, listening to all of this. She's like, it's okay. You don't need to. It's like, fine, fine. Maybe she's realized that now I shouldn't be running away from my parents all of the time. Although for some reason I do think I can actually give him advice on how to lead the planet. Will I ever see you again? Maybe. Someday. If you ever need help from a tired old man. See? They're covering up those plot holes again! Now she has a reason to contact him when she needs help from him in the future. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You fought with my father. Oh, that's a plot hole, isn't it? Oh, I wonder if they've got a line to try and cover up the big gaping chasm that we've made in the canon. If you ever need help from a tired old man. But we must be careful. No one must know, or it could endanger us both. Oh, I guess that's it. That, that just explains everything, doesn't it? That, that explains literally everything. Ooh, oh, why didn't she say she knew him over the message? Well, it was a message and anyone could have intercepted it. So that would have been dangerous. So she said another lie. Oh, okay. How come when she met him in real life in person, when she's surrounded by friends, she didn't say anything about it or in private or at any point during any of the movies i've just crushed a big massive hole in the canon and now here's a bit of dental floss that that should cover it up i think that does it nicely don't you pretty sure i got my thumbnail so they hug and that is the end of that and the destruction of all future canon congratulations so she goes back to her parents and off he goes back to Tatooine. So Kenobi empties his emo cave. Honestly, I'm not sure why he has to move. Oh, it shows he's leaving behind all his sad feelings. I'm upset about this show. I'm not going to move out. But instead, Kenobi visits Luke and Owen. And for some reason, Owen collects all of those blocks out of Portal. First thing Kenobi said is, what are you doing here? I thought you were going to keep your distance. And to be honest, I kind of agree with you at this point. He had one job to protect Luke. And when Luke needed protecting, he was on another planet doing a job that didn't matter. So who knows? The only time Kenobi has ever been around Luke Luke is when Luke didn't need any help whatsoever. But Kenobi has entirely changed his mind. Now, apparently, Luke doesn't need to be trained in the way of the Force or anything. No, it's not as if he needs to protect himself, despite the fact that he's already been attacked within a life-threatening situation and needed to protect himself. No, that just means he doesn't need to guard himself anymore. Oh, he'll be fine, right? Yeah, he just needs to be a boy now and stick his head in the sand and then no one will come after him because they certainly haven't in the past. The future will take care of itself. That's a stupid argument. Seriously, I know there's a lot of bumper sticker lines in this show, but that was a really bad one. He says the only protection he needs now, Owen, is you and somebody who can use the force and a lightsaber in case Vader comes and slaughters him. But after he sucked up to the parents and decided to walk off, Owen has a change of heart. Obi-Wan can blow me. Do you want to meet him? And with that, he comes over, bringing, of course, the famous toy, which is how Luke gets it in the original trilogy. Oh, that's how he gets the toy. Oh, this episode's so amazing. It's full of so much nostalgia. Oh, it's amazing. I tell you what is amazing, how easily pleased people are. And after six episodes where it wouldn't fit in many, many places, instead, we get this here. Hello there. Yeah, you've just ruined it. <laughs> you can't do that at the end of this episode and expect it to carry any weight, dude. That's not how any of this works. But then he's heading off into the distance. And just when you think, okay, now it's over, they can't do anything to ruin Star Wars anymore because this is definitely the end scene where he's riding off into the sunset. Oh no, don't worry. It gets worse. He's just walking along the desert, appears at the rock formation, and then Qui-Gon's just there for no reason whatsoever. Oh yeah, I know Yoda taught me how to talk to you, and that's what I was supposed to have been doing all of this time, but I was a bit upset in my fifis, so I just couldn't be bothered to do any of the training that I was meant to do, and now I'm just walking along the desert, and you turn up? Such great storytelling. Well, took you long enough. That's because he wasn't trying to find you, or talk to you, or do anything else, because he wasn't training to do anything, because he didn't give a crap about you, so I don't know why you do about him anymore. 
Obi-Wan Kenobi is a failed character who couldn't even be bothered to do his only mission in life. Beginning to think you'd never come. Qui-Gon should have just slapped him at that point as if you're the one who couldn't be bothered to train to talk to me, mate. I was always here, Obi-Wan. You just are not ready to see. No, he was too lazy to see you. He couldn't actually be bothered to commune with the Force. I don't know why we think we can treat a character like crap, absolutely destroy them, make them appear like utter filth at the start of six episodes, and then by the end of six episodes, we're all just going to act as if none of that happened. Obi-Wan Kenobi was a useless waste of space at the start of this series, who was just an emo kid crying in a cave over his own fifis, and was supposed to believe, oh no, now you're just an amazing person with the force. No! You don't go from one end of this series to the other in this shorter space of time and have it make any sense. And with that, he actually rides off into the distance. And hopefully in the next few seconds, they really can't destroy canon anymore. What an absolutely pathetic ending. And the what's worse is I know loads of people are going to love it. They're going to lap up every single bit of nostalgia, every bit of paint that was just covering the cracks that you can still see. There's a big gaping wound underneath. They're like, oh, but nostalgia, it's amazing. And to see the scriptwriters put in the absolute bait. And that's all it was bait of so many one-liners throughout the entire episode. One-liners that only existed so that people could come along and when anyone pointed out all the objectively massive problems in the episode and the series with the rest of it, with the rest of canon, they can use those lines to go, no, well, he said this four words and that means that that's not a problem anymore. That's not how a story works. And the character arcs for this entire series were out of this world. Obi-Wan Kenobi was a waste of space. Suddenly, I'm amazing! Leia was just amazing all the way through, and was actually even responsible for the defeat of Vader. Yes, Leia defeated Vader at 10 years old. Congratulations, that's a great thing I never saw coming. And then you've got Reva, the marvelous, the moral, the person who defeated herself because they couldn't allow any other man in the entire story to actually defeat her, because that would be humiliating to a type B, and you can't do that because she's a strong, independent inquisitor. And what? We're supposed to think she's good, or that she's worthy of forgiveness, or anything, because she saved one person from herself? After all of the hundreds, or thousands, or tens of thousands of people that she's killed her entire life, no, now I'm a good person, I promise. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that you actually got caught by the person that you were underneath. You weren't a good person because you're a good person. You're a good person because your allies, your evil empire kicked you out of it. You had no other choice. And we're supposed to think of a character which is pure evil, is now good and moral. And it's like, if she gets her own series, that is going to be absolutely hilarious. Or hey, maybe she won't need her own series. Maybe she'll just be the main character of Obi-Wan Season 2 again. But this series was utter destruction of canon and characters. The way people acted was out of this world, and the writers knew it. That's why he came out so smug. Oh no, I've actually covered it. I don't break canon at all. He knew he'd broken canon. He knew that all the episodes utterly destroyed canon, but he will now go out and point to all of those little one-liners at the end and go, see, I didn't I fix all of it. Uh, you're not supposed to just fix it with four words at the end of your season finale. It's supposed to be a holistic approach that the entire series where everything fits together and always obeys canon the entire way through, that's how it works. No, you can't just utterly destroy something and then try and tape the pieces back together with one line of your script. But hey, uh, positives, what could possibly be the positives? Well, at least you tried to at least kind of plaster over your plot holes, which is a lot more than Wheel of Time did, I guess. Will that do? Oh, and the scene with Obi-Wan and all the rocks was a cool scene. It's just unfortunate that the only way he could actually get there was by channeling the power of Almighty Leia. This show was not Obi-Wan Kenobi's show. This show was purely to crap on him as a character all the way through and then somehow just forget it right at the very end. And it's like, oh no, he's really powerful now. It's all fine again. No, no, it isn't. You can't mistreat a character like that and expect the audience to like you for it. But what this was, was the Reva and the Leia show, as well as some random type Bs which are no longer with us. It was their show, despite the fact that their name wasn't on the door, everything else about the show was. And so if I'm supposed to sit here and be thankful for it, or grateful that, oh, I've just got more Star Wars, more content, just give me more content, then no, that's not what you're going to get here. What you're going to get here is, um, well, exactly what you deserve. But let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you like the video, like the video, subscribe. More videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one, which 
I haven't quite decided what it'll be yet. I've got a few things in mind though, but let me know what you'd like to see reviewed next down in the comments below as well. But for now, that's it from me. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.